Welcome to episode 88 of the Toadstool Boardroom for the week of May 1st, 2024. My name's Logan Plant, and I'm joined, as always, by Justin Corais. What's up, Logan? And Chris Shriver, who's mid-drink of water. Got him. Hi! Got him. We got him. And I'm back this week. Uh, great job in the Toadstool <laughs> Asylum last week, gents. That was a fun listen. And I just want to throw out that... I don't hate most of the franchises in your segment of franchises that Logan hates. Do I hate Star Fox? Yes. But uh, beyond that, you know, not, not, I love Punch-Out. I love, I love uh, Donkey Kong Country, the new ones at least. And my favorite part of that episode was when Justin said, uh, I don't care if he hates them, and he, he didn't even say my name. It was just like in the <laughs> middle of your segment, and Justin's like, I don't even care what he thinks. I love Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> I love to just be referred to as he, he who must not be named. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Our our our, our own uh, personal he who must not be named. Listen, uh, we we say you don't like him. You say you you do like him. Agree to disagree. Okay. Okay. Very good. And Nintendo Land? Are you kidding? That game's amazing. Nintendo Land rules. That's, but it was a fun yeah. show last week. Uh, thanks for holding down the fort. But I'm back this week to talk all about. <laughs> Endless Ocean Luminous, because I have been drowning for the last week. That's why I wasn't here last week. Uh, not actually, but Endless Ocean Luminous is out today, the day this episode comes out. It's Nintendo's first Thursday release, so we have to get used to that now. And I reviewed it. That review is up right now on IGN.com. It's the lowest score I've ever given to a game. I gave it a wow. 4 out of 10, which means bad on IGN. I encourage you to go check out the full review to find out why. But, guys, this game was... One of the most ridiculous progression systems I have ever seen in a video game in, in my life. And I think that a lot of it is like, oh, well, if that progression was gone, would you have enjoyed the game? And the answer is no to that either. So not only does it gate its story behind this ridiculous progression, which I will get into, but the game is just not very good. And this was my first time with Endless Ocean. And from what I understand of the first two, I think they sound a lot better than this one. Because this one throws out a handcrafted ocean world with cool story missions, with these drab, bland, samey, procedurally generated segments of the ocean that you visit that change with, with each dive but they all blend together and feel exactly the same i feel like i saw after the first hour with this game i was like i get it this is all there is and that is pretty much true there's over 500 species of ocean life to catalog and after three or four hours i had like 400 of them so i had seen almost every species of fish that was in this game and then the rest is going into these very samey uh, underwater dives scanning fish I've already seen before, searching for these random objectives that I never found. It is one of my least favorite Nintendo games on Switch, and yeah, it, it's brutal. I don't recommend you spend your money on this. I want to open the floor to you guys to see any questions that you have about Endless Ocean before I kind of talk about some of the progression issues. Do you put any of the blame for this on the Switch hardware itself, or do you think this is a boring game on even a supercomputer? I think it would help if the game looked nicer because the game's honestly, it does not look great. I think mm -hmm. that the fish are the main thing that actually look pretty good, like the character models of the different aquatic life. It looks good. It, it looks fun when it zooms in on them, when you scan them and you get a quick little paragraph about them. I wish you could learn a little bit more about the fish and this could be more of kind of an edutainment tool than it really ends up being. But the fish look good, but everything else doesn't. The The diver, it, your character itself, kind of looks like this PS2 era character model. Very, like, no textures, just very bland colors, not great. And then the ocean itself is, is pretty ugly also. And the water doesn't look very good. Like, if you're swimming and there's no objects in front of you, you can see, like, distinctly five different shades of ocean color just, like, in bar lines. Like, it's just not very attractive to look now, at at all. So I think that would help. Now, like, certainly something like water can matter a lot. Um, is there much water in this game? There is there is endless water. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, I'm no. not going to say what you're oh, trying no. to get me to say. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do oh, it. Oh, no, I'm not I'm not, not going down that road. I, I just think, <laughs> okay. I just think you know, if, if literally the setting of the entire game is in the water, maybe make the water look good if you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, there, is, there is no... Uh, I think, from my understanding, the first two games had, like, a boat that you would sail around on before you dive down, or a kind of a hub area to prepare for your dive. Now, this just drops you into the dive, and, and you start the mission, and, yeah, the gameplay is ridiculously samey through and through. Chris, anything you want to know about this this game? I'm clicking around, um, like, I, I have, I had a vision in my mind of what the original Endless Ocean and, uh, 
whatever the sequel was called. I think Blue World. Blue Wave? Uh, maybe. Or is that Wave Race? <laughs> We're no. thinking of Wave Race. Yeah. What's the, um, what's the Blue Storm is what you're called? thinking of. Wave Race oh, Blue, Blue Storm. Storm. Yeah. Um, in my mind, like, I remember that game looking decent. It's also, like, in my mind on a CRT. Um, uh-huh. But even going back, like, and looking at some of the screenshots that are just on Google, like, it's not a bad looking game. And what I've seen of this looks pretty uh, offensive. So I don't know yeah. that I would necessarily attribute this to just the hardware as much as um, just what is what seems to be a pretty unpolished product. Yeah, yeah. There's I think a distinct lack of art direction. I think that the closest thing you could call it going for is realistic, but realistic and Nintendo hardware are two things that do not mix very well. Uh, so I think yeah, the art style just ends up being super bland and forgettable. Where something like Abzu is gorgeous and very stylized and kind of that Wind Waker cell shaded type feel. And this series just doesn't really go for that, but I think it would have benefited if it had. But again, the fish look good, and I guess that's what matters. But the rest is not fun to swim around are you are you able to do anything interesting or have any in, like interesting encounters with the fish like can i can i boop a great white in the nose and lose a hand what is like no, ride a can't. dolphin like wave race <laughs> i think that actually some of the earlier endless oceans had dolphin training and this one doesn't i this was a line in from my review i said that the whole game just feels like an underwater bus stop where no one wants to like hang out with each other they're all just kind of doing their own thing waiting for the bus to come because the fish don't interact with you and they don't interact with each other like there will be a mm-hmm. great white shark swimming by all these tiny fish and they just don't care they're, they're just all chilling like there's no you can't get attacked by an apex predator you don't ever see the food chain at work in the ocean they just sit there it's just like this gallery of animated fish models that don't do absolutely anything and so that was another it it feels really hollow it does not feel like this living breathing ecosystem like something like monster hunter where the monsters actually interact and you can follow them and see where they like to sleep and monsters get into tiffs with each other and it's a really small element of that game that i've always really appreciated and this game which is all about observing that ecosystem has none of that it is just fish sitting around with each other doing nothing and granted i've never been to the bottom of the ocean so i don't know what it actually looks like down there but i know that fish have to eat each <laughs> other often and it just does not happen in this game yeah it's it's arguably not procedurally generated every time you go down there either yeah yeah that's that's a good point too but i want to i gotta tell you guys about the progression because it is seriously the most absurd thing i've ever seen it is disrespectful of the player's time mm. and i could not finish this game before i reviewed it i read every wow. review that was posted i did not see anybody that finished this video game it's insanity so basically what happens is to it, it, i'll reference f-zero gx here f-zero gx you have to pay with currency to unlock story missions That's just how it works. It's the only game prior to this one that I've seen that in. So you race in Grand Prix, you do versus races, you earn points, you go to the store, you purchase the next story mission. This game does that, and it does it in such a terrible way that it just becomes this mindless, it does feel endless task to unlock all the story missions. So what you have to do is to unlock each story cutscene, you have to scan a thousand fish. Then you go back to the story menu, you unlock the next cutscene, the cutscene stinks. It's like three minutes. The story's really bad. And like one story mission is like, oh, there's a dolphin. He's hurt. We need to reunite him with the rest of his herd. You swim for 20 seconds and then he's reunited with the rest of the herd. Mission over. That is the best story mission I played in this game. And that was what it was. So the story missions aren't even worth it when you get there. But then, but at the end of chapter four, it tells you, hey, before you can do chapter five, you need to clear the mystery board. And the mystery board is Endless Oceans, one of their achievement systems. And it is this 11 by nine grid of 99 mysteries. And before you unlock them, each mystery is just three question marks. It does not tell you what to do. Think like the Smash Brothers achievement board or Kirby Air Ride. Like they have those grids where once you complete something, you unlock like a piece of music or a costume or something like that. So that's what it is in this. It's, it's this grid of 99 mysteries, but you don't know what they are. And what they end up being is scanning these rare creatures called UML, which means unidentified marine life, 
or looting certain treasure from the treasure chests, which are randomly placed, and the contents within are randomly generated, and they're placed across the randomly generated maps, or, like, discovering certain types of biomes, like, oh, you found your first underwater temple, here's a check off the mystery board. So you're going in having no idea what these 99 mysteries are, and then to find them, you just need to hope that when you open a treasure chest, the right coin is in there to check off the next mystery. Or that when you summon a UML, which takes between 45 and 90 minutes when you're playing alone, one doesn't come up that you've already had because they do repeat. I summoned the same fish three times in a row. It took me over three and a half hours to do so, and I got no credit on the mystery board for doing this. So I estimate to beat this game, it could take you a hundred hours maybe of swimming around these randomly generated pieces of ocean that you've seen it all after the first hour to track down a treasure chest which aren't easy to find by the way the radar system is terrible and there's no upgrades for it and then you open the treasure chest and it's like oh nope i already had that coin or you call the monster and it's like well i already called that monster it's miserable you, i i finished with like 55 pieces of the mystery board unlocked but the thing is the more you unlock, the harder it gets to unlock new ones because your RNG odds are going down because it's a higher chance of a repeat. It's it's ridiculous. And this is the story that it is blocking. You can't see the end of the story content unless you do this. And yeah, that is ultimately why I ended up giving it a 4 out of 10. I was already really low on it just because the random generator nature of the map stinks and it doesn't look great, and the gameplay is repetitive. I was around a 5, maybe a 6, if it had gotten better in the story, but then they reveal this mystery board thing to you when I was already, like, 15 hours into this game, and it's like, wow. I tried. I genuinely tried. <laughs> On Sunday night, I played for 8 straight hours oh trying to God. unlock mystery board content, and I unlocked, like, 5 squares. Like, it's insane. And I've never seen anything like this in a video game. I cannot believe they did this. And that is why I do not recommend that you play this. Because it's just, it doesn't respect your time. And I don't throw that around lightly. Like, I think that it, this is a true example of a game just disrespecting you as the player and saying you have to. It's like, Justin, if I asked you to pick a number between 1 and 50, and I have one in my head. And every time you guess, I switch which number I'm thinking of. And then you have to guess again. And we have to do that until you guess every number from 1 to 50 correctly. That's what playing this game feels like. It's insane. And I, don't, I cannot think of anything else like it. Well, I don't know about you, Chris, but I'm sold. When are we diving? <laughs> oh, I already pre-ordered just now <laughs> as he was talking. Wow, the, okay. The convincing, the convincing has uh, really taken Right, I, I, I think we have the uh, next game for our next uh, boardroom uh, gaming meetup. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the multiplayer is there. Uh, I played in some sessions with Nintendo, and it's fine. Again, just like how you don't really interact with the fish, you don't really interact with other players. It does make some of these objectives go faster, because they can help you find treasure or scan fish quicker. But it just makes tedious tasks a little and a little sooner. It, it's not fun. It's not more fun in multiplayer. It's just less tedious, <laughs> which is the best that I can High do. High praise. So. Yeah, really. Yeah, this one's rough. And Chris, you were even asking me before the show, is this just not your type of game? And no, I think I actually am going to buy the second one on Wii, which has great reviews, because I think I would really like a good version of this game. I think it's a cool idea, but this just executes it almost as poorly as I could imagine. Uh, yeah, like that like this being set up. That was kind of like, like, so when No Man's Sky originally came out, uh, I remember that a lot of the, I mean, there were a lot of problems with that game, but one of the things that people did praise it for, if you're like a type B person, like I consider myself type A, very like object or uh, goal oriented and very organized yeah. and all that, mm -hmm. aside from all the crap behind me, um, I, uh, I, I didn't really get that game. And, um, you know, w w with this one, at least looking at, uh, like I was looking at the MVC post that you had put up. Uh, in the the Facebook group, shout out to everybody on there, um, and a lot of the uh, responses that you were getting were people that were saying like, "Well, I feel like uh, you just don't get it. Like you don't get what this kind of game is is or is supposed to be." Um, and like for oh, my, I think I, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I've never played this game, and like I uh, I get I get the problems that Logan is kind of presenting here. Um, and this is me defending you. It's just like, 
I feel like if I were to, if you were to put me in front of the the Wii release and then this one, I'm probably going to the Wii release every time. Um, just on on what is a polished product versus what is not, um, <laughs> and it's kind of surprising to see. But also, like if you look at Arika's track record, like it is all over the place in terms of games that they've produced or like ports they've done. They've um, done Tekken like they, Eight. Yeah, <laughs> so Tekken crazy. Eight. They ported Dodon Pachi on the PS2. Um, which is like one of the best bullet hell shooters ever. Um, the 3D classics, they did those uh, on the 3DS. So like, it, it's just, it's all over the place. They did the other Endless Ocean games, but um, I digress. I mean, it, it's it's a shame that uh, this has kind of been handled the way it has been. I wonder why it was rushed. Or what what I imagine is rushed. Like, I don't want I don't want to assume, but like, yeah. based on the presentation it just seems like a lot of this game was like what if we built endless ocean and like almost like an ai built it like yeah here's the the framework of what we need <laughs> like go go build mission structures based off that and we'll go program it thanks mm-hmm. honestly yeah, it's, it's i think i think their biggest missed opportunity and their biggest mistake was just not including the eel from mario 64 <laughs> yeah. Who knows? It could be in there in chapter five. The world that, will never that, know. That, that that's yeah. that's hidden behind that one square that you gotta get. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait for someone to beat this game <laughs> and log their time on how long to beat. Because somebody's gonna. Somebody's definitely yeah. going to. I know some people who are criticizing my review and said, Well, I can't wait to find the ninety nine mysteries. Have fun. That's, I'll just say <laughs> let enjoy. Us, let us yeah. know when you do. Yeah, I, I hope yeah, it's a shame because I was excited about this one, a Nintendo franchise I'd never tried, a niche one that was coming back, and I'm someone that I was hoping this was going to be a great podcast game. Like, throw mm. on a podcast and turn on Endless Ocean, dive in, and explore, but it's just not. It's just not pretty enough or interesting enough or fun enough to do that. It, it misses on all three accounts, and... Like, there's just better options out, out there for me like that, like an Abzu or like a Forza Horizon 5. I still sometimes just turn on that game and just drive around and, and go places I haven't been yet. And I was thinking this could kind of check that type of box for me, but no, I, I'm never going to play this again. Like, this is, it is, it's bad. It is bad. Yeah, nin- and yeah. Nintendo Life said a similar thing in their review. Like, they, <laughs> they basically said, like, it would be a great game for you to kind of hang out online and chill with your friends. Um, if it didn't have the problems that it had. But then you also, like, you have to be on Discord or a phone call because none of that is built into the Switch. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're poking holes in that. Um, yeah, it's a shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a bummer. So that's Endless Ocean Luminous. Yeah, if anyone out there does end up picking it up, which I don't recommend you do, uh, yeah, let us know if you ever finished it <laughs> in six months when you finally find all 99 mysteries. I wouldn't be surprised if they changed this if they patch this out honestly because it's that egregious and yeah a lot of reviews called it out and i'm sure some players are going to get to that point in the story because again it presents the mystery board to you as optional for the first 15 hours of the game and i'm like okay that's a good goal for completionists to chase and then they lay down the hammer on you and say oh actually you have to go do all this it's crazy so yeah that was a disappointing one and nintendo's releases this year have just it's been a rough year so far I was wondering if we should get into that a little bit. Like, there's a lot on the docket, but yeah, like between Mario vs. Donkey Kong and mm-hmm. Princess Peach Showtime, which like that's for a certain audience, and I get that. But like, uh, I, what, what's what's weird is what's going to happen is Paper Mario is going to come out. And we're going to be like, this is the best thing since sliced bread, and it's like, yeah, because it's Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. Like, of course it is. Um, but like new. Game wise, it's been kind of rough out here this year. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the, the 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 pantry is kind of barren, and what's left in there is not your top stuff. Otherwise, it probably would have been pushed out by now. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, the best thing Nintendo's put out so far this year is the Splatoon DLC, and that was great. That was a lot of fun, but that was a DLC to a game that a lot of a lot of people aren't going to pick that up. So if we're talking like brand new releases, you had another code. So that was good. I liked that game. And then Mario vs. Donkey Kong, which whew, us on this show did not like. Uh, and then Princess Peach, which I, again, thought was good. But Nintendo game of the year so far. Finished it. Yeah, Splatoon DLC. Yeah, that's it. And then I don't like Luigi's Mansion 2, and that's what's coming next month in June. I already know what I think of that game. I don't think it's good. Uh, but fortunately, 
the thousand year door is here to save us that's coming out in three weeks and previews are here uh, this uh, preview went up on ign from adam bankhurst who detailed some improvements that were found in the remake like a partner ring where you can change party members without visiting the menu. And that's important because party members have use outside of battle, like for puzzle solving and things like that. Like Coops, you can kick a shell to hit switches and, and Flurry, she can like use her wind power to blow down uh, paper walls, things like that. So that's nice that you can do that without having to pause. There's a new gameplay hint system from Goombella that you can access at any time. New entries in the sound and art galleries you get from collecting shine sprites and star pieces and Rogue Port's Battle Master, who will tell you battle secrets and let you practice combat and then there's a there's a new character called ian fumis so that's like an ace attorney like pun right there who will help at the trouble center for the side quest because sometimes those get a little unclear where to go next so i guess that character will tell you where to go and then there's a new badge called the nostalgic tunes badge which lets you listen to the original soundtrack and that badge looks like a gamecube which is very, very cute. And then this is most important to me. Nintendo Life said that the backtracking issue has been addressed. This is one of the biggest problems in the original Thousand Year Door uh, because there's this quest, especially near the end of the game, where you have to revisit every location you've been to. And it's crazy. It's, it's crazy in the original, just walking down these same pathways to get there. Uh, but they kind of, it seems like they revamped the warp pipe room. So now you can access all previous locations a little bit easier. The original had a warp pipe room, but it was a little bit cumbersome. And it seems like they've streamlined this process a little bit, made it easier to get to the warp pipe room and more clearly labeled which warp pipe goes to which place. So a lot of nice changes. Justin, I want to start with you since you have played the original what do you think about these improvements and how are you feeling about the remake three weeks from release uh i'm excited honestly i i like the improvements because they all sound like really quality of life focused stuff um i'm glad they're not really changing the core way it plays i don't want that to change i think it plays great um and so and so don't mess with that um a lot of adam's like a, a lot of the early part of adam's uh, preview uh on ign focused on the graphics and honestly that got me pretty hyped um it like this looking beautiful and like super mario rpg i think look beautiful um uh, i think adds so much enjoyment to it because it, it's 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 already has the same great story it already has the same great gameplay but if it looks amazing in everything we've seen including in pre pre uh, previous trailers and in this preview sounds like it's going to be spectacular um it sounds like if i could have waved a magic wand and asked them to do it a certain way this is basically what i would have asked for yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, Super Mario RPG, I know a lot of fans weren't happy with, they tweaked it and made it kind of easier in a lot of ways with those super moves that you can get. And yeah. I don't know how you ended up feeling about that, Justin. It, it, yeah, I mean, we, we talked about it. I, I, I certainly found it comically easy. Uh, I, I think I mentioned, like, I, I don't know that I use, like, a he like a healing item in That's the right. game, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and so I, and I don't recall. I don't recall this game being particularly difficult, but hopefully they, and I'm all for them, including options like the battle master and things like that to help you figure out like yeah. how to be effective. Um, I hope it maintains enough of a challenging to be interesting to move forward and have battles, not just be like at time sync. Uh, and so as long as they don't screw with it too much, which it doesn't sound like they are. Um, I, I like everything that they say. Yeah. I think that, Talking about the graphics, Justin, I think that Origami oh, King is one of so the good. prettiest games on Switch. Mm. Origami King looks amazing, and say what you want about the rest of that game. I love it, but a lot of people don't like the battle system. You're getting the traditional one here, but Origami King rules, and it is gorgeous. And yeah, assuming that this remake is intelligent systems just like origami king was uh, because i just don't know if they've officially said that but i imagine it would be since they handled the original and they handle every paper mario uh, but intelligent systems they were they were cooking with the visuals and the music on origami king it was awesome so if i can get that level of presentation with my favorite paper mario game which is thousand year door yeah we're in for an awesome time and i'm really excited about that chris what do you think of everything we've seen so far i think on paper everything all but two Nice. things have me uh worried i'll say that okay. <clears throat> or not worried i'm sorry uh, i'm excited about all the two things um i i don't think it'll matter but i think uh the the drop from 60 fps to 30 i think people will some people will be upset by that i think if you aren't like a uh diehard thousand year door fan like it's not gonna matter i don't think this is the kind of game where it really matters that much um like it does not turn-based rpg like it really doesn't it, like button timings right um I think the other side, or the other thing is, I hope that the, I mean, it's at the end of the game, so it's probably not as big a deal, that warp pipe 
uh, thing where you have to backtrack. Um, I feel like they would have put that in there originally as like a here's one last chance to grind and level up and mm -hmm. do what you need to do before you wrap this up. Um, I hope this game, and I don't think it will, it doesn't have the opposite effect that Super Mario RPG had where that game was super easy and then all of a sudden like they take what would have been time that you would have been grinding and they like strip it out for the sake of um, pacing like like getting you to move through the game and that you are under leveled when you get to the end from and my like, memory oh. of the original that's not a big grinding section you're just revisiting the towns that you went to so you oh is really that all it is a lot of things in the field yeah it's like very like just monotonous go back to all these towns you've been to there's not a ton of combat in that section okay um if that's the case then i think this is great i think i think any game like the lego games are infamous for this if you go into free play and it's like you have the ability to change to whatever character that you have in your roster yeah. like mm -hmm. that is always a good thing i don't want to play the same level 16 times because i forgot r2d2 like it's yeah. just not <laughs> it's not my cup of tea um any decision that's going to respect your time, especially a game that is this long, uh, I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I cannot wait for this. I think this is. Yeah, I'm be very really excited awesome. for this. Yeah, I'm super hyped for people who haven't played this one to to play it for the first time because it's a classic to me. Uh, Justin, have you played all the Paper Mario games? Where are you at with that series? I haven't played Origami King. Okay, but you played oh, them all wow. up to that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you like original Paper Mario or Thousand Year Door more? I like Thousand Year Door more. I think it feels yeah. like very much like what you expect out of a sequel. Um, very expanded with added to the combat, the way it looks, the the way it flows. Um, I I think it's the best of the Paper Mario series from my experience. Although, uh, you know, I prefer vanilla RPG most. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I I'm super excited, and I hope that it means Mario and Luigi is next because that's all that's missing. Oh, from how Switch great would and, that be? That would be so great. Well, some Superstar awesome. Saga, some Inside Story. Yes. As my, I love Thousand Year Door, in, Bowser's Inside Story might be my favorite Mario RPG. I that would game is so I would <laughs> happily play that on Switch or whatever comes next. Yeah, thank you, Justin, for serving that up to me. Speaking of what's coming next, Switch Two rumors are back again. The rumor mill is in full force this week with a couple of headlines like Switch Two rumored to have magnetic suction based. Joy-Con on claims from third-party controller manufacturer and Nintendo Switch 2 handheld mode said to be clocked crazy low for better battery life. So these are both rumors and the first one comes from an accessories manufacturer called MobaPad. So a third-party Switch accessory manufacturer saying that they got to get their hands on a Switch 2 but didn't actually get to see it. So like a Dune style, put your hand in the box and yeah, you don't you don't see what's inside. Uh, super weird and then and then the other rumor comes from a conversation that was had on a podcast about a uh, switch to battery life and and all that and you know how i feel about switch to rumors and how sick of them i am and how i don't love discussing them that much and justin you were telling me some similar stuff earlier what do you think of this uh, i mean at, at least like a lot of it i think is dumb <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and okay yeah. so it's so it, what I can say is it's definitely dumb, but I don't know which dumb it is. Either it's dumb to make up this this weird story about the mystery box, um, and and you know telling yourself that fear you know fear is the mind killer as you reach in and like feel whatever's yeah. in there, um, or if Nintendo like did legitimately do that, that's also super dumb. What is the point of that? Like, what do you what do you hope to achieve with that? Like, I mean, if you want to get give them a heads up without showing them the product, just give them some like I don't know dimensions and specs and stuff. Uh, it's absurd. <laughs> I think it's, it's I think it's, it's silly, totally um, but that's fine. You know, we we like silly a little bit. Uh, I, I think something like magnetic Joy-Con uh, could potentially. I mean, from a mechanical standpoint, totally understand how it could work. Based on how much things like that would that would cost more, uh, and you know, you have additional potential failure points. So I'm kind of skeptical of like the concept just from something that Nintendo would want to do. Um, but you know, if uh, you know, if, if it were easy to predict what Nintendo was going to do at any juncture, we would all be in a very different line of work. Mm -hmm. Here's my thing. I like the current Joy-Con, not the controllers. 
I like the, how they slide on and off the rails. I've always thought that worked well. I don't know. Have you guys either? Well, and the the, the, the click is I, stick on the rail. The click is iconic. Like it's it's like the way they snap into place is literally part of the identity of the product. Uh, and and you know, did someone in our Discord say that Nintendo Snap was going to be the name of of this? If, if that was a that was a YouTube ad leak, is what. Uh, oh, that was that. Right? Yeah. Oh. yeah, wasn't that it? Okay, weird. But, but I can't yeah, remember so, if that was the name. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah and like, maybe it was and like especially like you know when you know if the magnets get like too close, other oh, magnets get demagnetized, you get old, you get what have you, and they stop like holding your Joy-Con on. Yeah, that's gonna be so annoying. That uh, I, can I I'm take not... that on a plane, <laughs> right? If it has the magnets on, right? It? Yeah, can I go through security with that? Yeah, the thing that I didn't, uh, that was the, the main piece of it that I couldn't wrap my head around was if you're doing it in addition to a rail system, I think it makes more sense because those rails, if if your only controller is Joy-Con and a Joy-Con grip, those rails do wear over time. Mm -hmm. So like having yeah. magnets in place does reinforce that uh, stability, I'll call it that. But like if it's just held on by magnets, I'm just picturing my five-year-old nephew grabbing that thing by the controller and then right. it's just falling off Bonk. um yeah like oops yeah. you know especially um, if any kind of motion so, controls yeah there's no way like it right? has to it has um, to be the rail like like like, well, like th there i am in in tears with my bow and arrow out and i, I quickly turn and my uh, nintendo just goes flying yeah. through the window <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be the new like Wii remote through the TV. <laughs> or, oh no, the, it's the gonna come with the scratches the screen. The main body is gonna yeah. have a wrist strap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be that'd be awful. Uh, the yeah. name that was the the fake YouTube leak was Switch Attach. That was, was the it. one that was in that YouTube survey. Yeah, that I think someone in our name. Discord said Nintendo Snap based on these new magnetic controllers. And yeah, I, I that, clever. I like I it. I could see them naming something that. Yeah. With new Pokemon yeah. Snap too on Nintendo Snap Sorry. systems, it does sound too much like a camera. Nintendo Snap. Yeah, it does. Otherwise, I'll yeah, like yeah. Chris, any other thoughts on these besides the magnetic controllers? I just don't understand why. Like Nintendo, I feel like has nothing to gain other than maybe the the cost of licensing um, of their mm -hmm. product to a third party manufacturer, like. If I'm MOBA pad and I'm making a Switch controller, I imagine I have to pay some sort of license fee to Nintendo yeah. to be able to manufacture that legally. Um, so, if <laughs> otherwise, I don't know why they'd show it. Like, there's no reason for them to do that. Yeah. Um, like, there, there's nothing for them to gain. Like, Nintendo wants to sell Nintendo accessories when this thing comes out. Um, also, so, if this was actually real and it was a company that Nintendo let hold their hardware. Don't you think they probably signed something saying not right. to talk about it, and this would be taken down by now? Like, come on, this has yeah. to be fair. right. It's like, if, up, if they let it? one guy in and put his hands on it, and then word got out, hey, this guy put his hands on things. Boy, I wonder where people could have gotten that information from. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I so think if get anything, Detective Pikachu like, on that case. <laughs> yeah. No, I've heard. Uh, I've heard the MOBA pads are actually like pretty solid products. Like, I I've never used one myself, but I wonder how much of it is like they're putting this out there they didn't actually see anything and all they're doing is like okay everyone has seen this rumor mill uh they're going to their website and they go huh that's actually a pretty cool looking controller and it's, then they end up ordering one like how much of like when sales the new game shark then? was like oh switch 2 is launching september 2024 <laughs> remember that from january uh, right like, come on right yeah it's it's all fake just wait for them to say something and i'm gonna point it out nintendo financials come out next week my favorite as always who knows? Maybe they say something then. Maybe they tell their shareholders something. This could be our first legitimate shot to get a code name or something or confirmation from Nintendo itself they're working on new hardware. Do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. It depends how the Switch sold this quarter. If it sold really bad, then they might come out yeah. and say, hey, it's declining, but don't worry because we're planning to refresh the hardware cycle. Q1 2025. Like, Next week could be the, the first time Nintendo actually says anything. I don't know if it's going to be or if it's going to be next time around, but yeah, just stop. I, I don't need to get on my pedestal again. Just stop worrying about it so much. Yeah, I look forward to paper. Look Mario to the day. Wall Street Journal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's uh, move on to our final story before we get into some EGADS emails. And this is from last week. No Samus in Fortnite and former Epic Games Chief Creative Officer Donald Mustard shared why. And 
Justin said this was not news. I found it interesting, so we're going to get into it here. Uh, so the the quote was, they got really hung up, this is Nintendo, got really hung up on their characters showing up on platforms that weren't their platforms. They would be thrilled to have Nintendo characters in Fortnite, but only just only if it's on their platform. For me and all of Epic, we were like, that's an absolute must. We want to make sure Fortnite is the same experience, no matter what screen or device that you're playing on. So it was Samus that they went after. And it didn't happen. Two ships passing in the night is kind of the vibe of this. Justin, I'll go to go to you first. Why isn't this news to you? Uh, I mean, because it's it's one wholly unremarkable that anybody, especially Fortnite, which has cameos from everybody, is inquiring with yeah. Nintendo about their properties and franchises. Uh, mm-hmm. I I would wager that Samus is not even close to the only person that they've asked about that, and that Fortnite's not the only person who's asked about potential collaborations. This is an incredibly normal thing that happens all the time, and it's extremely not news that Nintendo is substantially protective of their IP, and if the, and if they are even going to consider any sort of collaboration, they're going to give you a book about this thick about all the exact rules of every aspect of it that you have to be willing to abide by and if you can't do every single one of them they're just not gonna do it so that that's why i don't think it's news i do think to a certain extent it's a missed opportunity i think as we've seen from things like the fallout show like the last of a show and like the mario movie like there there is a a halo effect that you can do with like transmedia and Mm -hmm. and with putting yourself out there and you know putting putting a cool product done well in front of the eyes of more people so i think there certainly is some potential benefit to nintendo um to getting samus in fortnite uh (laughs) frankly they could use uh uh, all the help they can get on, on on that franchise getting more people into it um but as far as like this whole stories go, this is like I would have been shocked if any of this didn't happen at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just for me, you just hinted at what I wanted to say. My main point is that Metroid could use this. That's the one that could yeah. use this. It is not the mega seller. If you get Samus in Fortnite, if you put Samus on PlayStation in that way, Metroid will sell better. It just would. I think mm-hmm. that that would be a huge deal if that happened. And I understand Epic's side of this and saying, no, it has to be the same everywhere. If that's their thing, you can play Fortnite on your phone, on your Xbox, on your computer, whatever. But for Nintendo to miss out on this, I think is the bigger deal. Because yeah, they're very protective, but we've been seeing them loosen that grip a little bit through things like the Mario movie or the upcoming Legend of Zelda live action movie. And yeah, games is still the one place that they aren't, but they did put Mario on smartphones. That's not a Nintendo device, but they did it. And I think that Samus and Fortnite could have been a really big deal for them for a franchise that clearly they haven't given up on entirely. They're trying to make it a thing still, and this would have been huge. So I was just surprised to hear, and again, this isn't from Nintendo, this is from someone formerly at Epic, I was surprised to hear that the big thing getting in the way was Samus being on other platforms rather than Samus dabbing and Samus firing (laughs) a machine gun and shooting Mm. like someone from Family Guy. That was more surprising to me that that was the main thing. Like They would have loved to have Samus on Switch only, but just not elsewhere. So I think it's a huge missed opportunity for Nintendo to blow Metroid up a little bit. I think that could be just enormous because Mm. Samus is in Smash Brothers, but Fortnite's so much bigger than Smash Brothers. I think it would just be huge for that to happen. I I do think it actually... Go go ahead, Chris. What makes this a more interesting choice is when it happened. So Kratos and Master Chief were in Fortnite... uh, Chapter 2, Season 5, in 2020. December of 2020. And then Metroid Dread was announced in June of 2021 and released in October. So, like, Mm -hmm. why wouldn't you either... Maybe it was too soon. Like, if had they waited a year, like, they could have gotten more holiday sales. Um, I, I could see it from that perspective, maybe. But I feel like either way... Like, any publicity is good publicity as well. Um, like, I feel like this is... This is one of those weird, like, just Nintendo decisions where, like, um, they are just, their ecosystem is more closed off. They want to have that control. Um, and we're not seeing that so much, like, with Sony and Xbox being, having their games cross platform or on PC. Like, they're just, they're doing that. Nintendo just strictly isn't. Yeah. And these are two companies that are both doing very, very, very well for themselves. So they didn't, neither of them needed this, but it would have yeah. been cool. Yeah. yeah. Justin, you had one more thing to say? Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is that if there is probably a single Nintendo property that is the most well-positioned 
to benefit from this. It is Metroid because of how much it, it uh, you know, underperforms relative to other properties and because of how high quality it is. Like, it is good enough. I think that if you got more people to see it and experience it, it would have a significant effect uh, and would get its hooks in people. Um, and so I would, you know, I would love... I would love to see them grow the franchise because I think it's from a quality standpoint, stands shoulder to shoulder with your Mario's and your Zelda's. Yeah, totally. So that would be great. Hopefully prime four can be the big coming out party for Metroid sales numbers. I, I think that's the one that could do it. People are really hesitant to buy a $60 2d game. We just saw that again with Prince of Persia, but a first person shooter, if that's what they choose to call it this time, it could be a bigger deal. Hopefully that game does come out sometime soon. All right, Hopefully let's get that into game you does come emails. Out. Hopefully that game does come out, yeah. Let's get into EGAD's emails. You can always email the show, toadstoolboardroom at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at toadstoolbr. And this first one comes from Chad, who says, when you're playing a decent slash good game that isn't clicking with you for some reason, how do you determine whether to continue playing it with the hope it will eventually click with you more or stop playing it and move on to other games? I'm sure it depends on the game, but I'm curious to hear how each of you deal with these situations as adults with limited free time. Chad's examples are quitting Mario vs. Donkey Kong and Princess Showtime, speaking of Nintendo's banger lineup for 2024. Uh, not because I think they're bad games, but because neither of those games were fun or compelling enough for me to continue playing. I recognize other people may love these games, and that's great, just not my experience. And Chad says he has mi mixed feelings about this decision. On one hand, I feel relieved to move on to other more appealing games in my extensive backlog, but I also feel mild guilt for not finishing games that I paid money for, and some FOMO because I won't experience the those Nintendo games in their entirety. Justin, what do you think? Yeah, I get it. Uh, I, it. It can be tough, especially as you get older and time becomes harder to come by. I, wh what I would say is, like, you don't owe any video game your time or attention. Uh, and if you're not having a good time, uh, I know it can be hard to resist a feeling of remorse for moving on to it, um, but there, there are more good games than there are hours in the day. So I, I hope that... That's something that you're able to do. And something that, that I've tried to get better about doing myself. Um, I've, I've always had a really bad habit of being a, a completionist, which means not just beating the game, but turning over every rock. And I've tried to get better about that. Um, that being said, I, I, I agree with you that, in, in particular with things like, like FOMO, I mean, it is nice to be caught up on the cultural zeitgeist. And when we talk about games and what's happening right now, or even down the road when we look back, and get context from games that were out, you know, three, four years ago, having that like in your head is valuable. And so if you take, if you, t if you claim enough value from that, that between that and whatever you're getting out of the game itself is worthwhile, then it can be worth sticking in. But I, I, I really would, would urge you to, um, you know, view your time as valuable and protect that time. Uh, and if something's not clicking with you uh, and you're not sure if it's going to, doing things like reading reviews, especially, this is my advice to anybody who uh, like follows games media, things like that. One of the best things you can do actually is pay attention to the authors of pieces and find the ones whose tastes align with yours and whose opinions you find valuable for you and follow their work. And so if you can find people whose opinions make sense for you and click with you and they say something does become really good and get better you should you know yeah maybe give that some weight um and if you're not seeing those things and you're not seeing anything that indicates that what you've experienced in the last 20 hours is different from what you've done in the first 10 hours mm -hmm. then yeah I, I think being willing to to move on is frankly a gift for yourself that you should be willing to give yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that it's easy to get in like the sunk cost fallacy, like, oh, I spent money on this, so I have to spend time on this now. It's mm -hmm. like, no, your time is also valuable. Mm -hmm. Like people have different definitions for themselves of time versus money. What is more valuable? But both are valuable to me and I'm not going to waste my time. It's like, yeah. dang, I did waste some money on that. That's a shame, but I'm not going to waste my time just because I wasted some money. So that that's something that you, I've gotten more comfortable with over the years. And then, and Justin, to your point about being caught up on the culture man when i was first getting into games media i cared about that so yeah. much and like god of war 2018 i bought on launch i did not i could, I could not stand that game I, I do not like that game at all and i got swept up in the hype for it and picked it up and that happened time and time again and within the last couple of years i finally been like no i don't need to buy all these games on day one especially games that are going to be 20 bucks a year from now i don't need to do that and then I don't need to finish everything either. And something great for me that I have gotten uh, used to doing 
recently is if a game isn't clicking with me, but I want to see it through for some reason or another, pop that difficulty down to easy. Granted, mm-hmm. many Nintendo games do not let you do that, but Mario vs. Donkey Kong is one I was struggling with, and I turned on the simple mode where you have checkpoints and you have like five hits instead of just one because the hitboxes in that game are brutal, and I finished it on simple and had a much nicer time with it, so... I think that that's something to do too. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. That game is brutal in its open world elements. I turned it down to easy so I could just skip past those and just mainline the story and not be underleveled. Having a great time with it. So that has been something for me that, that's that been really helpful is like, you know, you don't need to be a capital G gamer and beat everything on hard or, <laughs> or even on normal. Like if you just want to get through it and move on to other stuff, pop that difficulty down and if that doesn't even do it for you just move on and then and yeah it's it's okay to move on there's so many games to play like if you have game pass you will never run out of games to play and i canceled game pass and i still will never have time to finish all the games that i wish that i could in an ideal world so you have to you have to pick and choose chris what's your take on this your home isn't a museum and i think this is something that i really doesn't have to be a museum and i think it's something that i am like learning um I I have, a, have for about 20 years now had a really bad habit of like game comes out day one. Everybody says it's like absolutely worth playing. You need to pick it up day one. And I think for me for a long time, it was um, I had the dream of like working at IGN and like you know, doing the whole basically what Logan and, and Justin are doing now. And I think that's great. Um, that part and, and this is just my own personal like journey, but like that part of my life is over and I'm fine with that. Like I, I really enjoy doing this show. Um, I have a house, I have a family, I have a wife, like all that. Um, and there are times on the show even where I will pick up and, and Mario vs. Donkey Kong and Princess Peach. I mean, they're the most recent. It's not it's not even recency bias. Like they are the easiest examples I can give of two games that I was like, I don't know, guys, like, I don't think this is going to be very good, but I'll give it a shot for the show. And I picked them up um, and I didn't like either one. And I think I maybe gave each game a solid two to three hours max of my time um and my my time for gaming is extremely limited anymore um and you just gotta let it go like you 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 can't hold yourself accountable for it the other thing i will say is like um if you are unsure of a game buy physical like you can resell these titles and that's what i mean by your your home is not a museum like you do not need to purchase a game digitally and then be stuck with it because you didn't enjoy it and, and be out that money. You have the ability, even if it, you lose five, 10 bucks on it on like Facebook Marketplace, resell it or trade it, trade it into GameStop, see what credit you can get for it if it's soon enough within that release window. Um, or like Logan said, don't buy that game in the release window, especially if you're unsure of it. Most titles that I buy anymore, uh, unless it's first party Nintendo or like a absolute banger, which we really haven't seen a lot of in a while, um, I won't pick up until it's $20 or under. Um, and, and it's the argument that I make not to get into that thing, but it's why I've gotten into steam so much is because those sales happen so frequently. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, don't be so hard on yourself. It's a video game. Like, and I know like it's, it's easier said than done, but it really took me a long time to, uh, get over that a little bit. Um, I used to be like, it, it, it would actually cause me physical stress because, I wasn't up on everything that was happening. And like, there's so much coming out anymore. You can't be, mm-hmm. um, yeah. this is your hobby. You should be able to enjoy it, you know, like just yeah. fine. And, and if something's not clicking with you, there's nothing wrong with you. And there might not be something wrong with the game, but like go do something that you will enjoy. And sometimes it's not even video games. Like just go, go outside, go do something, <laughs> you know, that's yep. Chris's advice. Go outside. I love it. That's, yeah. that's really good advice. The sun, yeah. the sun's it's, all right. It's just true put though. on sunscreen. That, that's been my advice all year for people who are obsessing about Switch Two. Is like just you go take a walk. <laughs> go go yeah, take seriously. a breather. there. Touch grass, yeah. as the kids say. Yes. Yeah, uh, that is what they say. Yeah. So yeah, Chad. Hopefully that helps. But it's like if you got a meal at a restaurant that you hated, you wouldn't finish it. Like it's fine. Like you would. You, they take the plate back with half the food still on it, and that's fine. You're not gonna shoot. I didn't. I didn't finish that meal. I didn't eat everything that was on the plate. And, yeah, like yeah, some, that's just going to happen, man. Here. Like some, yeah. some cost fallacy is the thing, but like how many other games do you own that you could be playing otherwise that like you <laughs> maybe need to get back to and you enjoy more than what you're like, ah, geez, I didn't like that. It's not worth it. I know, I'm, 
I'm so thankful to be out of the endless ocean. I can't even tell you guys. I'm so <laughs> glad that it's over. Sometimes, sometimes, depending on what you do for a living, you might have to play through a game you're not enjoying. Yeah. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah, and then I, I have this obligation to myself, and actually to all of you listening to the show, to play pretty much everything Nintendo puts out. But that I consider that part of my work more so. Because I come here and I tell you guys, don't buy Endless Ocean. Don't do mm-hmm. it. And yeah, hopefully I helped somebody. Actually, I know some people in our Discord were like, shoot, all right, going to pass on it now. So yeah, that I, I do that, but that's more because I want every game to have a voice on this show that Nintendo puts out. That's just that's just part of how we do things around here. But yeah, it doesn't mean that Chris has to buy six, uh, $60 Mario vs. Donkey Kong if he doesn't like I'm it. I'm not buying I Endless Ocean, it. I can tell you that. Yeah, I'm glad Logan it. reviewed it. Yeah, like I'm glad don't you reviewed it. it because yeah, I was that would have been one that I'm I would have day one. I'm glad we did not all meet up to, and agree. We're all, right, we're all <laughs> buying Endless Ocean. We're all going to be there day one, guys. Clear your Join weekend. Join us on the Toadstool Boardroom yeah. this Saturday for mm-hmm. Endless Ocean Online. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Never, never. I might delete it from my Switch just to just to clear the three <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. We got time for uh, one more before we get out of here, which is from Jordan, who says, "I beg y'all to cover why Logan and Justin have not played Hollow Knight. Please give us some kind of clarity." P.S. I love everything y'all do with the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Justin, why haven't you played Hollow Knight? Ooh, that's a good question. I should at some point. Uh, I think I would like it. Uh, I mean, so truthfully. Um, Nobody's ever assigned me any Hollow Knight related work, so uh, that's one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, in my personal gamer tastes, I am somebody who actually really does like scope and spectacle and things like that. So uh, I tend to gravitate away from indies. Um, and uh, for, for better or worse, like, I do play some, but typically they need to do something like win a Game of the Year award, like Hades, before I'm mm-hmm. uh, going to, to put my hands on it. And it sounds like Hollow Knight is of this quality. Um, so. It, it is something that I, you know, if I find the time I'd like to at some point, it, it seems like something that's up my alley. Uh, there's it's no there's no specific reason I haven't uh, sought it out, but I also haven't had a specific reason to seek it out. And that's really what it's come down to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tried Hollow Knight. I did. I downloaded it day one when it was the hot thing on Switch because that was in that era where I still did that. And I just couldn't do it. And I actually was talking on... Uh, to Tom Marks at IGN about Hollow Knight. And he's like, yeah, it's first four hours are horrible. Like, it's brutal. And I was like, yeah, I could not do it. And and so, and um, I, I'm going to try it again at some point. I also, back when I tried it, did not like Metroidvanias very much. Mm. I was had not yet grown into that genre. And then that's different now. Prince of Persia, Metroid Dread, I love more modern Metroidvanias. So I'm going to play it. I am going to play it at some point. I don't know when that will be. Um, but yeah, I'm going to get back to it. But I tried the first two hours. I died like 15 times. I didn't know where I was going. It was dark. It was scary. And I was out. And that was that was it. Yeah, but with everything Chris has, has gushed about this show, I think when we started this show is when Chris was playing Hollow Knight. And he talked it up a lot. And yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it kind of sold me to, to go back to it. At some do, point. You, do you think we're going to see Silk Song soon? Okay, on that <laughs> note, that's it for this week in the Don't Sue Boardroom. <laughs> We're a weekly Nintendo show here on Thursdays, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you like to listen to your shows. Video version is up on YouTube. Justin, where can people find you, and what are you working on? Ooh, so I've got a bunch of uh, guide videos that I put together on IGN for Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, so check this out, that out. I'm officially at the point where they let me get away with terrible jokes, uh, and that's a lot of fun. Nice. Um, I also just had a review go up today on GameSpot.com. I reviewed uh, Top Spin 2K25, a return of a classic tennis franchise. Um, I have thoughts about that i have mixed thoughts about that i think the tennis action is amazing but there's a lot wrong with it including one thing that's really really bad so you have to check out that review to find out what i mean um yeah it's a mystery board where you have to win 99 <laughs> that's right that's ways. right and and worst of all you can barely interact with any fish it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> no fish otherwise you can find chris. find me on twitter at k-o-r-e-i-s thanks justin chris where can people find you you can find me at shrives 93 you can also find uh some Endless Ocean Luminous Icons available on the Nintendo <laughs> Switch uh, online app that you can uh, customize if you would like to redeem, if you are so inclined. Um, awesome. Recently, uh, last night, watched my wife uh, take Tifa to the Golden Saucer. Very good. Final Fantasy nice. Seven Rebirth. Yeah, we thought it was going to be Red 13. It was real close. <laughs> <laughs> but like, my friend the last the exact second. same scenario. That's so yeah. awesome. It was so cool. funny. Um, I also started playing Lego 2K Drive on Steam Deck. Ooh, that game's super cool. fun. 
uh, yeah, cool. if you're looking for just like a very chill, uh, lighthearted racer that's like almost like Diddy Kong Racing meets uh, Mario Kart meets Forza Horizon, uh, it's worth checking out. It's fun. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've got my eye on that one. Maybe I'll give it a try. Uh, you can find me at Logan J. Plant. Go read my Endless Ocean Luminous review. Yeah, 4 out of 10. One of my, maybe my least favorite Nintendo game on Switch. It was rough, but it's okay, because Paper Mario is coming down across the horizon. Thank you so much for listening this week in the boardroom. Have a great week, and we'll catch you next time right here in the Toadstool Boardroom. <laughs>